Well, in, in health in general, I had always been uh, interested in uh, people and service to people. Uh, I actually took a, a classics background education in both high school and college, so I didn't take a typical uh, uh, pure science approach to medicine. I actually majored in college in Greek and <laughs> classics and philosophy, <laughs> and I took a, just enough science courses to get into medical school. But I, I, I wanted to do something that had to do with humanity, that had to do with people, and had to do with public service. So that was the broad reason why I wanted to go into medicine. I wasn't quite sure what particular aspect of medicine I wanted to go into. I got very interested in infectious diseases from a number of standpoints. It, it's it's a, 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 a discipline where dramatically you can make great impact. It, it, it is a, it's mostly acute. There are some chronic infections, obviously, but it's the kind of things where there's life and death uh, uh, issues that are arise, and there are also more broad global health issues that have to do with infectious diseases. It's an exciting discipline. That doesn't mean that other disciplines are not exciting. For me personally, I happened to get turned on, as it were, by the issue of infectious diseases. Immunology was just a, a, a burgeoning uh, discipline, particularly human immunology, when I was in medical school and did my uh, training as an intern, a resident, and then a fellow. So I got very interested in the relationship between the immune system and how it responds to different infectious diseases threats. So unwittingly, as I was going through my training in medical school and my fellowship, I was training for HIV AIDS because that's exactly what HIV AIDS is. It's an infectious disease of the immune system that remarkably compromises the immune system and leaves you open to a whole variety of opportunistic diseases, which was really the reason why when HIV AIDS came along, even though we didn't know what it was, we didn't know it was a virus, we suspected it was a virus, but it clearly was impacting the immune system, that I actually was at a stage of my career that I was really rather successful, so my colleagues tell me, in the particular area that I was involved in, and I made a decision back then to essentially stop all of that and start focusing on this very bizarre, unusual, curious disease that was inaccurately felt to be restricted epidemiologically to a certain population, namely gay men. And as it turned out, obviously, that was not the case. But that was the reason why I got involved in HIV-AIDS. Well, I, I remember very, very clearly, you know, people always say I, uh, they remember where they were when John Kennedy's assassination was announced, you know, exactly what you were doing. You remember where you were when 9-11 occurred. Uh, I was sitting in class, uh, uh, not in class, I was sitting in my office at the NIH, and I picked up this uh, that comes every week. It's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I had already been, for the last eight or ten years heavily steeped in infectious diseases research and practice at the National Institutes of Health. And we were seeing a lot of patients who had infectious complications of chemotherapy. In other words, cancer patients who were given chemotherapy, their immune system was suppressed, and they developed these bizarre diseases, which were not common infections, but are called opportunistic infections. I was sitting in my office at the NIH in Bethesda, and I remember picking up the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report and looking at this, and I remember very clearly it was June 5th, 1981. I was sitting there, and I looked at this as five gay men in Los Angeles die of pneumocystis carani pneumonia. And I said, I knew what pneumocystis carani pneumonia, you only saw it in immunosuppressed patients. And I remember, why would otherwise healthy people die of pneumocystis. It's unheard of. It just doesn't happen that an otherwise healthy person would get pneumocystis pneumonia. And why gay men? And I remember I put it down and I said, gee, that's a curious thing. Why would their immune system be suppressed? Perhaps they took some drug that suppressed it. And I got an uneasy feeling, but I, I let it go. A month later, on the 4th of July of 1981, the second report from the CDC came out of 26 individuals now not only from Los Angeles but from New York City and from San Francisco again astoundingly all gay men all previously healthy not only had pneumocystis pneumonia but also had this other bizarre disease which is almost always seen in immunosuppressed people called Kaposi sarcoma and I remember that was the first time in my medical career as young as it was at the time I was just beginning 
I got goose pimples looking at this because I said, oh my goodness, this is something new. I have no idea what it is, but it's not good. Um, so that's when I decided, much to the dismay of my mentors and advisors, that I was going to put aside what I was doing. And it's just as you had said, I'm trained in infectious diseases. I'm trained in immunology. I have my board certification in both. If there ever was a disease that I should be looking at is a disease that's an infectious disease that involves the immune system. And that's when I started to admit the first patients with HIV to the NIH and study them from everything from observational therapy early on, because we didn't, I mean, observational studies, we had nothing to do but take care of them. And they were, you know, obviously deathly ill when they first presented to us. And that was my first initiation. And 28 years later, 27 years later, I'm, I'm still, still doing it.